Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Carlini, and I'm currently working as a contributor to the foundation following 12 years of experience in medical device sales, during which I sold orthopedic capital equipment into hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers. And I'm Thomas Andre. I'm longer in the medtech industry than I want to admit, starting with surgical lasers and moving to Finland and with open MRI. Got acquired by Philips and started with focused ultrasound back in 2005 when Philips started the Sonalif program. Since last year, I'm with the foundation as the European ambassador for focused ultrasound. Like many of us here, I have been in a couple of technology driven companies. So we have put together some slides to illustrate a few ways how to look at our business. As engineers and physicians, physicists, with bright ideas, more often than not, the development of a piece of equipment is where it all starts. So what are you then planning to sell? Is it that piece of equipment? Or is it a healthcare solution around patient-centric therapies? Hmm, maybe a little bit too many buzzwords and probably too ambitious for the small and mid-sized companies in our FUS industry. An opportunity for your customer to diversify his business Focus ultrasound is a new technology, so that can drive new business. Or something your customer can make a lot of money with. Well, that can, can be a good proposition. I, I sold my first MRI systems, actually, that were um, small extremity scanners, and not to radiologists, but to orthopedic surgeons. And they bought it, well, okay, for the, for the nice pictures it, it made but mainly because they could make half a million extra in a year. So that was a good proposition for them and I sold a lot of them. So you may also want to do, sell something that you can make a lot of money on in the long run. So let's explore this. John? The first model we will discuss is the direct sale of capital of equipment from a manufacturer to a healthcare facility. In this model, the customer funds the purchase of capital equipment either in full or with a significant down payment and an agreement to pay the balance over time. The purchase agreement typically includes an equipment warranty and service contract for a predefined period. It also typically includes installation, maintenance, repair, and customer training. As the, after the expiration of the warranty, the customer is responsible for the cost of service and maintenance and will typically be interested in entering into a service contract with the manufacturer. In this model, the risk of loss lies with the, with the customer. The importance of, of demonstrating long-term value creation will be higher here than it will be with the models that follow. The administration will want to know that their physicians are committed to using this technology for, for years to come, and they will want to have a viable reimbursement pl plan established in order to justify making this investment. This can be another form of a direct sale, with the difference that you don't sell to, to the user, meaning hospital or physician practice, but to a leasing company, and you get your money. For the customer, this means they don't need to put all the money on the table immediately, but pay over the lease period. At the end of the lease, the hospital pays the leasing company, the residual value and the title of the equipment goes to the lease to the hospital, pretty much like your car lease. As this is a full commitment of the hospital for the monthly lease payments and the residual values, hospital CFOs may have an issue with this for an economically unproven technology like it is FUS, unfortunately still for many indications. Similar to the car lease, where the big car manufacturers have their own bank in the background to provide the financing, in health healthcare, the large equipment vendors may be in such a position too. Personally, I only know of GE and Siemens having that capability, but there may be others. In the operating lease model, the customer leases capital equipment through a third party or capital or captive equipment leasing company. The manufacturer guarantees the residual value to the leasing company, and the leasing company remains, maintains possession of the equipment's title. A key point with this model is manufacturers need to keep track of the timing of, of these lease agreements. Roughly one year prior to the end of the agreement, the manufacturer should focus on either renewing the lease or signing a new lease for upgraded equipment. With 
Properly negotiated lease terms, this model is generally neutral on the economic risk of loss scale. Now we come to a model where you can help your customer to diversify his, diversify his business by offering a new type of procedure and take a share of the business risk. Your customer may not be 100% sure that the new procedure will fly, and he is worried he can get uh, enough patients to treat and who would pay for it. Especially with high cost capital equipment, there is a high barrier to enter such businesses. You can help by reducing the purchasing price of your equipment, by, but compensate with a share of the revenue your customer is making with the new procedure. Well, there are two important aspects you need to consider, value and control point. You need to understand the value your procedure brings clinically to the patient and how this clinical value can be captured in an economic value, also known as currency in a given market. Who is willing to pay how much for getting the procedure done? Is there a health insurance system with reimbursement? Do patients pay out of pocket? And are there enough patients who can, pay, can afford to the procedure? These are all questions you need to consider. The other aspect is control point. You don't want to rely on the honesty of your customer when it's about money. They can think of, you can think of some software keys uh, to count procedures, but that can be hard to implement reliably and inevitably will trigger a lot of discussions like software doesn't, doesn't work, counted incorrectly, etc. Much better is it to have a disposable that is required for the procedure and unique to you, and that customer cannot get it anywhere else, like in this example. Then part of the price of the disposable becomes the revenue share per procedure. This also gives you a, a very flexible way of modeling the business and adjust as your customer grows procedure volume. In this model for pay-per-click, um, the risk sharing is driven to an extreme where you don't sell your equipment, but charge your customer only for usage per procedure. No risk for the customer as they don't need to pay if they don't treat patients. But that means all the risk is on you. Also in this model, it is critical to have a control point as just discussed. And in case it doesn't work, it would be good. You can pull the equipment easily. And you also would need somebody with deep pockets to finance making the equipment in the first place. Once the train is rolling, you may be in a position to finance new systems out of the cash flow coming from existing customers, but that will probably need a good number of well-performing customers um, <clears throat> to work out. And once your customers have a running business, they want, want, may want to buy the system for good and lower their cost per procedure. And maybe by that time, you don't want to sell them equipment anymore. From an operational and financial uh, point of view, you may want to separate equipment R&D and manufacturing from the system operations part of the business. Or you find the one with the deep pockets who is interested in, uh, who would then be interested in running the operations and service part. In the rental model, the manufacturer provides equipment to the customer and charges rent on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. The manufacturer maintains ownership of the equipment and ensures it is working properly and free from defects. The economic risk of loss is squarely on the manufacturer in this model. Some questions to consider here. How portable is your equipment? What infrastructure is needed in order to deliver, pick up and transport the equipment to and from the, this facility? Are any of these costs associated with this infrastructure able to be passed on to the customer? Or can they be built into the rental, rental price? While this model will likely be necessary to employ early on in the sales cycle with a new customer, the goal here will most likely be to quickly demonstrate value and move the process along to a model with more, with more of a shared risk and increased commitment from the customer. And here's something completely different. It's a business uh, model or a business opportunity, a pure service company. All metal as we discussed, all medical equipment needs regular service. For small companies like in our part of the industry, it is a tough call to set up the infrastructure needed to provide reliable service and uh, spare parts in a large country like the United States or diverse, diverse ge geographies like Europe or Asia. 
There are third-party service providers in other industries and also in healthcare. For them, the single first company is too small and too specialized to be interesting, interesting and commercially viable. Maybe pooling service from, from multiple first companies could help uh, and come to a critical volume to make sense operationally and economically. This is a summary of the business models we have discussed. One of the key differentiators to consider here is whether the funds come out of the capital, the customer's capital budget or their operating cash flows. Typically, large customers or research system, systems have significant capital budgets, while smaller hospitals and ASCs are less likely, le less likely to. Therefore, large hospitals and research centers are more likely to be able to absorb the economic risk of loss and will be open to the capital budget models. While smaller hospitals and ASCs will likely need to finance large purchases out of their operating cash flows. The key here is to understand that your customers' economic needs will vary, and it, is, and it is important to develop different business models in order to maximize your revenue opportunities. And here's some last considerations. We all know that we need to understand uh, our customers need to be customer centric and so on. Uh, but it's kind of critical that you identify the real decision makers early on. I've seen it so often that the sales guy says, oh, I have such a good relationship with this customer. But the question is, who is the customer? Who makes the decision? So he has a good relationship to the department chair, sure. But um, then in the end, maybe, he is not the final decision maker and there needs to be some funding of the system. So better to check out the, uh, the hospital CFO early on in the process. I was on a, in a panel discussion, listened to a panel discussion in the Medtech uh, conference the other day. That was actually, what do CFOs really want? And one CFO pointed exactly to, to this uh, critical issue that Sales guys talk to um, the department people, to the head nurse, and, and so on, and make nice plans and spend a lot of time. But then the hospital CFO has other priorities or on the C-level, C-suite, they have made other priorities and, and um, investment decisions already. So he said, come to me early and then you can save you a lot of, then I can save you a lot of time. The other thing is, Customer centric. As John has said, uh, the, you need to understand their business model and you need to understand their definition of value, which is probably different for different in different markets anyway, but maybe even different for each customer as such, for smaller hospitals, for larger hospitals, but some define value other than others. Talking about value, you clearly need to communicate your value and your return on investment to your customers, sure. You, you need clinical data for regulatory approvals and reimbursement. However, for customers and payers, economic data become increasingly important and you need to be able to demonstrate economic value too. At least you need to be able to demonstrate that it doesn't stand in a way, in a, in a sense that the procedure costs additional money and the hospital would lose money. And more considerations, how can you develop additional revenue streams besides selling a box? Okay, um, maintenance, we have discussed it. Every system needs regular healthcare, health checks, and this can become a substantial part of your revenue stream in the long run. In the beginning, it is more a burden, but better embrace it from the start and make sure your customers praise you for good service. They understand that newly developed systems like likely have their issues. And this is part of being an innovator. If you can fix them quickly and they can go on, you have your customers on your side. Also training. Initial training and guidance for first procedures should be part of your handover protocol, but they also should be a limit to the free training you provide. Now, I've seen it so often that there is a high turnover in staff at a site and every time they call and ask for support, this can become a considerable cost. You can sell application training packages 
the same way as service contracts with regular visits. We also have mentioned disposables a couple of times. So they are an idea. <clears throat> the ideal disposable is something that represents value, is unique to you, and you can make it for $100 and sell it for $1,500. Gel pads and decast water is hard to argue for that kind of a price, uh, especially as your customers can get it virtually around the corner for $15. So think of something smart that differentiates you and, and is, is unique to you uh, that creates value for you and for your customers. So that was it. We hope there was something for everybody. So please stay on for the discussion. Cheers.